This is part three of the Hidden from Jehovah's Witnesses video series. We're going to be dealing with dates in uh, this part of the video. Three dates that are very important to Jehovah's Witnesses, two of which most Jehovah's Witnesses know nothing about today. We're going to deal with 1914, 1925, and 1975. When you ask Jehovah's Witnesses leaders these days what happened in 1975, they will deny that they ever had anything to do with the events of 1975. Most Jehovah's Witnesses who are in the group have no clue what happened in 1975. Years ago, Jehovah's Witnesses tried to recruit me into their group. And I'm not the kind of person to go join some group without doing research. I want to find out what I'm getting involved in. I think it's only wise. Well, I began to purchase their books and look through and read through what they had written. And I learned that members who are Jehovah's Witnesses are required to obey whatever the leaders say without question. You don't have the authority in the group to question what the leaders say. They put up a bunch of articles telling their members they are not to exercise independent thinking no matter what. They must think like the group. The leaders give you the questions and the leaders give you the answers. And unless you answer the way the leaders say answer, they will kick you out of the group. And then they'll shun you. I found it interesting when I went to the JW website. In their facts section, they ask, do Jehovah's Witnesses shun former members? And they say no at first, and then they say yes, they do. They can't even give you a straight answer on that. One thing I learned, though, here's one of their books, Jehovah's Witnesses and the Divine Purpose. You're told as a Jehovah's Witness you're supposed to trust these leaders. They call themselves the faithful, discreet slave. They call themselves the governing body. But I learned when looking through their publications that the leadership doesn't even be honest about even the smallest of things. Let me give you an example. In this book here, Jehovah's Witnesses and the Divine Purpose, page 63, they have a role play where there's a Jehovah's Witness and there's somebody trying to recruit into the group. And a simple question was asked. I want you to hear the answer. Take a listen to this. Page 63 in this book, Jehovah's Witnesses and the Divine Purpose. It says... But is it true you have never published a biography of Pastor Russell? That's the founder of Jehovah's Witness Group. John, that's right. Jehovah's Witnesses admired the qualities he possessed as a man, but were we to give honor and credit to Pastor Russell, we would be saying that the works and success were his. But Jehovah's Witnesses believe that God's spirit, uh, that it's, it is God's spirit that guides and directs his people. So they're saying they never wrote a biography about their founder, right? That's so simple, so small. Why lie? Why lie? The divine plan of the ages. Divine plan of the ages. This is a Watchtower publication. Watchtower, I'm going to put it up on the screen for you. You see there, Watchtower Bible and Tract Society publication, right there. Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, right there on your screen. I'm going to show you right here in the book. What does it say? I'm putting it right here on the screen. Watch our Bible Track Society. I'm just going to slide it right over. Right over. You see it's the same book. Same book. Scrolling down. What does that say? It says biography of Pastor Russell. And this biography of Pastor Russell that they claim they never wrote goes on for page after page after page after page. But they claimed they never wrote a biography on Pastor Russell. Yes, they did. They lied. If they'll lie to you about something as minor as to whether or not they wrote a biography about their founder, and remember, they said if they wrote a biography about their founder, it means that all the praise and the glory for what happens with this group goes to him and not to God. I began to wonder what else were they not being honest about. The Jehovah's Witness leaders try to claim that outsiders are the ones that started the whole rumor that the Watchtower Society had predicted that the world was going to end in 1975. Well, when you look in their publications, you find otherwise. 
Here's an example of their first publication dealing with the issue of 1975. Take a listen to this. And for those of you watching the video, the actual photocopy is on the screen for you to see. Watchtower, October 15, 1966, page 628 and 629. Rejoicing over God's Sons of Liberty spiritual feast. Only a liberated people can preach a release to, to captives. Conventioners were told in the speech, preach a release to the captives, which thrilled them with its hopeful outlook. Jehovah, the God of freedom and liberty, has freed his people from Babylonish bondage and has given them a work of liberation to do. That work of liberation and salvation must go on to the finish. To give aid today in this critical time to prospective sons of God, announced President Nor. A new book in English entitled Life Everlasting and Freedoms of, Freedom of the Sons of God has been published. At all assembly points where it was released, the book was received enthusiastically. Crowds gra gathered around stands and soon supplies of the book were depleted. Immediately its contents were examined. It did not take the, the brothers very long to find a chart beginning on page 31 showing that 6,000 years of man's existence end in 1975. Discussion of 1975 over overshadowed about everything else. The new book compels us to realize that Armageddon is, in fact, very close indeed, said the conventioner. Uh, surely it was one of the outstanding blessings to be carried on. So as you just heard from that article there, dated Watchtower, October 1966, page 628-629, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society was the one that began the whole 1975 issue. It was not outsiders. It was the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society themselves that started the whole end of the world would be 1975 thing. And they started it off with that article and this book, Life Everlasting and Freedoms of the Sons of God, that you just heard them mention. In this book, we'll put it up on the screen, page 29. It says these words. According to this trustworthy Bible chronology, 6,000 years from man's creation will end in 1975 and the seventh period of a thousand years of human history will begin in the fall of 1975 CE. So 6,000 years of man's existence on earth will soon be up. Yes, within this generation. Who started the whole 1975 being the end of the world thing? The leadership claim was outsiders, but I've only been checking their own publications. They're the ones that started it. Now, when they release these books, their members get very excited about it. Why? Because if the leaders speak it, far the members are concerned, it might as well be coming directly from God. So, some of them even went to the press. And what you're going to hear right now is an interview that was done 1968 with a Jehovah's Witness elder and I want you to hear this man brashly and boldly tell this reporter when she asked him about 1975 telling her that she will perish in 1975. Take a listen to this. Mr. Philip Rees, the assistant to the presiding minister at Watchtower House in Mill Hill, London, spiritual home of Britain's 54,000 witnesses, a glossy complex of meeting halls, libraries, hostel accommodation and printing works from which each week magazines and books in five languages, including Croatian streams, met me on Thursday. I challenged him that the threat of a year of doom, 1975, seemed to be a fairly wild and irresponsible surmise. Uh, well, I don't accept your term, the year of doom, 1975, uh, but we don't... Um put it as a threat. We firmly believe that uh, in the near future this system of things is going to perish because the Bible plainly says that all the way through it. But uh, we want people to uh, appreciate that it is the prelude to the kingdom of God. You see, you can sweep away the old before the incoming of the new. Well, if the end does come in 75, will we all be dead? Yes, uh, Armageddon, when it comes, is going to mean a sweeping away of this system. And the system of things, of course, is built up of individuals. That's why we do not tire of telling the people, you must now come out of this system of things, come out of Babylon the Great, and take your stand for God's kingdom, because that alone is going to survive. What will happen to the rest of the people? The rest of the people will perish. How? 
by um, the um, by the forces of uh, God. Uh, just how I don't know. Uh, I don't know exactly how. It will have to be selective, because the Bible says that the sheep-like ones are going to be preserved, and the goat-like ones, those who resist the kingdom of God and the the instruction of Jehovah God will perish. So it must be selective, whatever it is. And the leadership of the Jehovah's Witnesses continued to seek out the press to push this 1975 date. This one here, the Arizona Republic, 1969. You see it right up on your screen. Title of the article, Witnesses Give World Five Years at the Most. Writer of the article, Marie H. Hollings, Republic Religious Editor. This is what it says. Within months, or at the most five years, the end of the world as we have known it will occur, and the thousand-year reign of Jesus will begin. This is the view of the approximately 400,000 members of the sect calling itself Jehovah's Witnesses. According to Earl Burton, Paradise Valley Unit of Jehovah's Witnesses, the prediction is based on the estimate that 1975 will mark the end of 6,000 years since the time of Adam and Eve, and that according to Scripture is when Armageddon will occur, Revelation 16, 16. By Armageddon, he explained, he doesn't mean the destruction of the world, but rather a change in the political system of things. All presently existing influences must be eliminated, and that is quoted. It says next, also quoted, after 6,000 years of de deterioration of mankind, there will be a 1,000 years of refining mankind, he said. At the end of that period, man will be perfect as Adam and Eve were before the fall. He said there will be no death and no need for an act of reproduction. Men will know when this period begins, Burton declared, by signs of the downfall of organized religion. He cited Revelation 17. Let me scroll down to a little bit more of his prediction here. It says here, He predicted people will abandon religion as we see it today with its hypocritical priests and their handouts. Then the political leaders will abolish religion. Then will come the destruction of politics and the battle of Armageddon. The survivors will be those who stayed obedient to God and neutral in politics. That's a pretty big prediction he let out there as a Jehovah's Witness leader. And all of this was supposed to take place in 1975, according to the Jehovah's Witnesses, and they went to the press with it. And this article here is from Time Magazine, 1975. It says, Witnessing the End. If this turns out to be the last time they all got together, the thousands of Jehovah's Witnesses who gathered last week in New York City's Yankee Stadium for an international assembly will not be a bit surprised. In fact, they fully expect the cataclysm of Armageddon within the next few years. The latest calculations of this energetic, eschatological-minded sect date the end of the world in autumn 1975. Where did they get that information from? They have a picture there of Nathan Knorr, one of the presidents of the Watchtower Society, standing there at the assembly. Getting his picture taken by the press, the caption underneath says, Knorr, soon to depart this wicked scheme. The leadership of the Jehovah's Witnesses had a whole campaign going on called It's Later Than You Think. This here is the Awake magazine, October 8, 1968. The title, Is It Later Than You Think? Question mark. Subtitle. Is time running out for this generation? What will the 1970s bring? October 8, 1968. Continuing to push, this 1975 will be the end of the world thing. The Jehovah's Witness leaders continue to go to the press with their story that Armageddon not might take place, not could take place, but Armageddon will take place in the year 1975. We have here an article from the New York Times dated July 19, 1974. The highlighted section here says, the witnesses believe that in the soon to come battle of Armageddon, the forces of good will overcome evil, then an elect body will reign with Christ in heaven and the earth will be transformed into a paradise where the followers of Jehovah will dwell in everlasting peace. Folks, notice it says the witnesses believe the soon to come Battle of Armageddon. You do understand that this article was written in 1974? That would be about 48 years ago. 
No one logically is going to say that 48 years is soon. It would be like me saying, hey, I'm going to put a million dollars into your bank account real soon. And you go, really? How soon? And I say, mm, around the year 2070, being that this video is being put together in the year 2022. Would you say that the year 2070 is soon? No. But the leadership of the Jehovah's Witnesses was continuing to go to the press claiming that Armageddon was going to take place September the 5th, 1975. Not would take place, not could take place, but will take place September the 5th, 1975. We have here another newspaper article from North Carolina, 1968. The article's title, World Will Come to an End in 1975, Religious Group Says. The first paragraph here says, The world will come to an end in the fall of 1975, an international religious group said this week. The International Society of Jehovah's Witnesses has gone on record saying that 6,000 years of man's history will come to an end sometime during the fall of 1975, a mere seven years from now. Not could take place, will take place. Notice the last paragraph highlighted also. Lemur noted that as far as the witnesses were concerned, this information only made them appreciate the urgency of their ministry and the closeness of the promised battle of Armageddon with the 1,000 years of peace. The closeness of Armageddon. 1975? is not close to 2022. That's a long time ago. About as far as the year 2070 is from the year 2022. No one's going to say the year 2070 is close. It's far off. Yet when these predictions were made. These prophecies were made. As you're going to see later, they actually said these were prophecies from the leadership. They were being made boldly among the press. Am I supposed to believe that all of these news agencies just made up this story on their own? When they're quoting actual Jehovah's Witness leaders and Jehovah's Witness members and Jehovah's Witness elders telling them that these things are going to happen, the leadership of the Jehovah's Witnesses concocted this story. And when they began to see that their prophecy was failing, they tried to change and rewrite their history, as they do today, claiming that they never tried to predict the end of the world for 1975. But you're seeing the evidence here that they did. The leadership of the Jehovah's Witnesses has a big problem with being honest about their history and honest about their past. We're going to go back again to the speeches that they gave. Not everybody heard the speeches, but everyone would get the magazines. So what I'm going to be letting you hear, this speech is going to run long. I'm going to let you know it's a long speech, but I want to play it in its context. That's why I'm playing the long version. I want you to hear what the leadership of the Jehovah's Witnesses actually told their people. I want you to hear their actual words in the context so that you can hear them stressing 1975, 1975, 1975. At the end of this message, you will hear him say, stay alive till 75. You'll hear him talking about things he wants the members to do and not do, things they can do and can't do because the time is so short. This speech was given by a man by the name of Charles Sonutko in Sheboygan, 1967. And you'll hear him talking about the events of 1975 and the Watchtower's predictions. Take a listen. We'll all still hold on for life because as long as there's life, we find there is hope. If this is true of... Uh, most persons, how much more true would it be of Jehovah's Witnesses? 
because not only do we have the present life to hold on to and to live for, but we hold on to the hope of everlasting life. Because Jesus promised us in Romans, the sixth chapter, that the reward God would give would be everlasting life. So we have a strong desire and instinct to want to survive and pursue it and to eventually realize paradisaic conditions in God's new order. But in this uh, run for life, some of us looking forward to a change in this old system and its destruction for many years now, there are some of us who get a little weary and a little tired. And sometimes we just want to throw our hands up and say, I just don't know if I can go on any further. But uh, just like a runner, when he's running a course and he gets near to the end, just about the time when he thinks he just can't go in and on any further, he realizes, well, there's the goal ahead of him. He's come around the last lap, and there it is. Well, all of a sudden, he just seems to get some reserve power from nowhere, and with a sudden surge of energy on, he goes to break the finish line rope and win the prize. Well, now, as Jehovah's Witnesses, as runners, even though some of us have become a little weary, it almost seems as though Jehovah has provided meat in due season, because he's held up before all of us a new goal, a new year, something to reach out for, and it just seems it's given all of us so much more energy and power in this final burst of speed to the finish line. And that's the year 1975. There's been a lot of talk about the year. In fact, even this week, some individuals have uh, been wondering, well, what does it mean? Or do we dare talk about it? Uh, uh, is it something we can discuss among ourselves, even though we might talk, not talk about it too much in public? Do we really know what it means? Well, we don't have to guess what the year 1975 means if we read the Watchtower, because the Watchtower has been very explicit as to what the year 1975 means for us. If you wish to write down the page 262 in the 1967 issue of the Watchtower, we read, what does the year 1975 mean for humankind? The end of 6,000 years of human existence and possibly the time when God executes the wicked and starts off a thousand year reign under his son, Jesus Christ, unquote. What does it say? the end of 6,000 years of human existence, and that's all? No. It gave us a little more to think about there. Did it say, for certainty, the time when God executes the wicked and starts off the thousand-year reign by Jesus Christ? No. But it did give us a glimmer of light. It says, possibly, Possibly the time when God executes the wicked and starts off the thousand-year reign of his son, Jesus Christ, 1975. Doesn't that give you a little bit of uh, excitement about the future? Even if there is the possibility that that's it, when God will bring the battle of Armageddon and clean this whole earth off, and you'll be ushered right into a paradise earth forevermore never again to be afflicted with this satanic old system of things. It will be gone down. Well, it should excite all of us. There are the skeptics who say, well, I'm not going to think about it and not worry about it. Not even going to pay attention to it. Well, now remember, brothers, the faithful and discreet slave is used by Jesus Christ to do what? Jesus says to provide meat in due season. This is meat, and it's come at the right time, and it's in its due season, and it's not wrong to think about it. 
and to look forward to it. As far as knowing for sure, well, we know what we know for sure. We just read it. The end of 6,000 years of human history and possibly the execution of the wicked in the beginning of the thousand-year reign. And that should be exciting enough and talk enough for us. When you think about it, what a fantastic short span of time that is. How many of you here were in New York City in 1958? Would you hold up your hands? Great majority of you here. Where's the time gone since then? Just seemed like yesterday we were there. But do you realize that more time has passed away since that assembly in 1958 where a quarter of a million of Jehovah's Witnesses gathered than what is left to 1975? Hard to imagine, isn't it? Yes, that was nine years ago. It's only eight years to 75. How little time there is left. How much to happen. We just wait now with everlasting life in view and we serve with the future unveiling in front of us. Very soon now we wait for Babylon the Great to be turned upon and severely scathed and destroyed and decimated to where there is nothing left of her. And then the cry, peace and safety. We finally got rid of the old harlot. She's off our back. No more religion to bother us, the nation say. But uh oh, there they are, rearing their ugly heads up above the dust. Jehovah's Witnesses. Now with a message more fierce than has ever been heard before. Now with a taunt song to the nations. You see? We told you Babylon the Great was going down, was going to be destroyed. You said it would never happen, but you did it yourself. Now you're next. Jehovah will destroy you. You think they're going to like that? That's when they all combine, all the communistic and democratic powers together, with one objective in mind. Wipe out those people. And then truly we'll be rid of all antagonists and have peace and safety and we'll have our unified world. But when they begin to attack Jehovah's Witnesses, strange things begin to happen. It seems to be calamities are brought by Jehovah God in a fierce and, uh, and horrifying way, as though they've never seen things of this nature before. Flesh-eating plagues are mentioned by Zechariah that will sweep this earth, rot the eyes out of the sockets and the tongues out of the mouths. They'll run screaming out of their houses with this striking them, and yet they'll see Jehovah's Witnesses are untouched. I want to get in now. Let me be one of you. It's too late now. And then Jehovah God seems to bring the natural forces against this old system. Terror on air and land and in the sea. Fratricidal warfare, neighbor against neighbor. Every unhuman, inhumane thing that could occur, not only from men, but even from natural forces. And Armageddon seems to have two phases now. The latest Watchtower brought out, if you've read it, where it says that there's such a thing as a just war. Phase one. All the united efforts among the nations destroyed. All political organization gone. All that's left are the kings standing by themselves without an ally or friend in the world, all super suspicious of each other, all standing there tense. Phase two, Jehovah strikes confusion into their hearts. And in the mad the fury and flurry, they turn on each other, destroying one another. And what is left then, Jehovah God calls the supernatural angels and the cavalry of Jesus Christ to close in on them. 200 million angels with all their destructive power. And what a power that's going to be. One angel in one night is when the Syrian forces of Sennacherib came against Israel, destroyed 185,000 soldiers. 
Let's say that the 200 million angels of Jesus Christ are limited in power and they can only destroy 130, 185,000. That will give them the potential to destroy 37 trillion persons. There are near that many on the earth. In fact, that's 12,333 times the number of people even alive. All that power wrapped up in the cavalry of Jesus Christ. And all of that possibly has to happen and be finished within the year 1975. Exciting years ahead of us. And then look beyond that, the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. Know what that means? All the dead being brought back. Just think of the dear ones you've lost maybe in the last five or ten years. Don't you look forward to seeing them coming back? Well, it won't be long now. Look at what's ahead. Do you think you're going to mind having to work with the crops and the land when you find out that your loved one's going to come back and you have to plant a little extra for them? Do you think you're going to mind uh, when you're notified maybe a little in advance that you need some shelter, that you're going to have to build it on for your loved one as temporary living quarters when they come back? Just think what it's going to be like when the family is notified it's time and you all gather there waiting and you see them rise up out of the dust. Like Isaiah says, awake you in the dust, you residents. Come alive. Think you're going to mind seeing that? That's our future. What a wonderful one. The resurrection is something to stagger the imagination with immensity. When it comes to the number that will be back, we don't know for sure, but some comments have been made by the society that could give some idea. You may want to make note of these references, read them later. Things in which it's impossible for God to lie, paragraph 12, page 350. Billions who died before Jesus, billions who died since will be back. The latest publication, Life Everlasting and Freedom of the Sons of God, page 393, paragraph 26, thousands of millions. The Watchtower, 1964. Page 722, paragraph 24. And listen to this. Tens of billions will be back. How many are tens of billions? Well, at least 20 billion. Because to have tens of billion in the plural, you have to have two sets of 10 billion. So it's a very minimum figure. Let's say even 20 billion coming back. What a fantastic accomplishment that's going to be for our Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, there was a tract one time printed by the Society called Millennial Hope Explained, where it mentioned an estimated 20 billion would be back in the resurrection. Could be. This gives you an idea. It fires the imagination. Do you realize what an accomplishment and what an undertaking that's going to be? Why, if just 20 billion were brought back from the dead every day for a thousand years, They'd have to bring back 60,000 every day for a thousand years. Of course, uh, it most likely won't take the whole thousand years, the society has indicated. We don't know how long the resurrection will take, but that will probably squeeze the number up to where possibly even more would be coming back. What a thrilling time we have to live for, my brothers. How much we have to gain by serving God with everlasting life in view. But you know the sad part of it? There are going to be some of us here who won't see it, possibly. Wouldn't that be an awful thing? With all of that in the future, some of us here tonight may not live to see it. Will you? You know there's a way to find out? There's a way to decide right here and now whether you'll make it or whether you will not. Let us see what that is. Turning to Luke, the 13th chapter, we get some information on it. In Luke 13, let's begin to read Jesus' words. Luke 13, starting with the 22nd verse. Now Jesus is going village to village and city to city. 
verse 23, it says, Now a certain man said to him, Lord, are those who are going to be saved few? He said to them, Exert yourselves vigorously to get in through the narrow door, because many, I tell you, will seek to get in, but will not be able. When once the householder has got up and locked the door, and then you start to stand outside and to knock at the door saying, Sir, open to us. In answer, he'll say to you, I do not know where you are from. Then you will start saying, Well, we ate and drank in front of you, and you taught in our broad ways. But he will speak and say to you, I don't know where you're from. Get away from me. All you workers of unrighteousness, there is where your weeping and the gnashing of your teeth will be. What's Jesus saying here? What do you think he's saying here? Well, first of all, those of us here tonight that do not do what he says in verse 24, exert yourselves vigorously, will not be able to get in. That's step number one, exert ourselves vigorously through the narrow door. But then he describes a certain class of Christians in God's organization would find themselves in this position. It says, when the householder has got up and locked the door, then you start to stand outside and knock at the door saying, Sir, open to it. And who would that refer to? Well, as far as closing the door, when is it shut down? The destruction of Babylon the Great, the door will be shut down. And then it says, some of us will come and want to get into the Lord's organization then. And then we'll say, sir, open to us. And Jesus will look out at us and he'll say, I don't even know you. But then we panic and we say, well, we ate and drank in front of you and you taught us in our broad ways. What's that a desperation attempt to do? It's a desperation attempt to say to Jesus, Well, it's me. You remember me? I sat in front of you, and you taught us in your broad ways. Remember, I came to the Watts Tower study once a week? And you remember when the, when the circuit servant was there, I never missed? At every memorial, I came? What does he say then? I'm sorry, I don't know you. I don't recognize you. You didn't love the Lord's people enough to be there all the time. You didn't love my house enough to be there all the time. Now I try to come and show you love me. If you loved me, you would have been there. So I don't recognize you as one of my people. Get away from me. You had time to work righteousness. Now get away from me, you worker of lawlessness. You had your opportunity. Stand out there with the weeping and the gnashing of the teeth. Beat your chests. And wouldn't we? Wouldn't we at that time, if we were left outside, beat our chests in agony and gnash our teeth and weep and say, God, I was so close. What did I fool around for? Why didn't I do something with the truth when I had the opportunity? Why did I make all those excuses? Why did I try to fool Jehovah God? Well, now, who will be there of us here tonight? For the society has made application of this scripture in pointing out that those of us among Jehovah's Witnesses that are not regularly associating with his people without good cause, such as being flat on our back, will not be in the new order. And we're the ones that are going to come around when the doors close and say, I want in now. Sir, open to us. And Jesus will have to say, I'm sorry, I don't even recognize you. Now, wouldn't that be an awful thing? Do you see now why the society implores us year in and year out the same old thing? Brothers, get in the flock. Don't let any excuses get in our way. Nothing of any nature. 
There's only one thing that's going to count when that time comes, and that's that we are inside. And we hope that all of us here tonight are going to listen to the societies imploring. We're going to listen to their agonizing and treaty brothers get in because they know what's coming. And it's coming fast. And don't wait till 75. The door is going to be shut before then. So, what are we going to do now with our future? Why not be like the little piglet? You ever see a piglet born? It's quite an amazing thing. They come out from behind the mother's legs. They're blind, they can't see. They're still attached to their mother's umbilical cord. And somehow they've got to break free of that umbilical cord, come around the mother's legs and find the milk. How do they do it? Well, watch them sometime. They uh, tug and they pull and they scratch, they fall, they get up and they jerk and they yank. They fall again, and they get up again, and they tug and pull some more, and pretty soon they break loose, and those little legs, they go around the mother's legs, and they come up and they find their reward, their milk. Now we can do the same. We're going to fall once in a while. We're going to slip. It's going to be hard pulling and hard tugging, but don't give in. Get up again on our feet and run. The goal is there. Everlasting life. Serve with it in view. Do what Jesus Christ said, sir, with everlasting view, as long as Jehovah asks us. Jesus urged endurance on your part, and then he says, by enduring, you will acquire your souls. As one brother put it, stay alive to 75. <sighs> And listening to him speak, I have to say that the Bible verse from James 1.8 in my King James Bible, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. In what you just heard there, you heard him say 1975 would be the end, then it could be the end, then it might be the end, then it will be the end, then they're predicting that your dead relatives are going to come back, then maybe they'll come back. That's how they did in their speeches. They played all the bases, saying that it would happen, and it might happen, and it could happen, but they always stressed that 1975 was the big year. They knew not everyone would hear the speeches, but they knew that everyone would read the books and magazines. So I'm going to show you a bit more of what they wrote in their books and magazines where they came right out and said that 1975 would be the end. Awake October 8, 1966, page 18 to 20. How much longer will it be? When? This generation. So it was to our generation that Jesus referred when he added the key thought, this generation will by no means pass away until all these things occur. The generation that saw the beginning of the woes in 1914 would also see the end of Satan and his entire wicked system of things. Some who were alive then would still be alive when the end comes. It is to be carefully noted that the youngest of those who saw with understanding the developing sign of the end of the system of things from its start in 1914 are now well over 60 years of age. In fact, the greater part of the adult generation that experienced the start of the last days has already passed away in death. The generation to which they belonged is now well along toward its complete passing away. The time left then is definitely limited and it is very short. Note too that Jesus pointedly said, this generation will by no means pass away until all these things occur. So we should not look for the passing away of all members of that generation. The end of this wicked system of things will come before all members could pass away. 6,000 years completed in 1975. There is another chronological indication that we are rapidly nearing the closing time for this wicked system of things. It is a fact that shortly, according to reliable tribal chronology, 6,000 years of human history will come to an end. After 6,000 years of toil and bondage to sin, sickness, death, and Satan, mankind is due to enjoy a rest and is in dire need of a rest. Hence, the fact that we are nearing the end of the first 6,000 years of man's existence is of great significance significance. Does God's rest day parallel the time man has been on earth since his creation? Apparently so. 
from the most reliable investigations of Bible chronology harmonized with many accepted dates of secular history, we find that Adam was created in the autumn of the year 4026 BCE. Sometime in that same year, Eve could well have been created directly after which God's rest day commenced. In what year then would the first 6,000 years of man's existence and also the first 6,000 years of God's rest day come to an end? The year 1975. This is worthy of notice, particularly in view of the fact that the last days began in 1914 and that the physical fact of our day in fulfillment of prophecy mark this as the last generation of this wicked world. So we can expect the immediate future to be filled with thrilling events for those who rest their faith in God and His promises. It means that within relatively few years, we will witness the fulfillment of the remaining prophecies that have to do with the time of the end. Relatively few years. This is 1966 until 1975. That's few years. 2012 is not few years. Our Kingdom Ministry of March 1968 on page 4. Increasing your ministry increases your happiness. Since we have dedicated ourselves to Jehovah, we want to do His will to the fullest extent possible. Making some special efforts to do more than the usual helps us live up to our dedication. In view of the short period of time left, we want to do this as often as circumstances permit. Just think, brothers, there are only about 90 months left before 6,000 years of man's existence on earth is completed. Do you remember what we learned at the assemblies last summer? The majority of people living today will probably be alive when Armageddon breaks out. And there are no resurrection hopes for those who are destroyed then. So now, more than ever, it is vital not to ignore that spirit of wanting to do more. So here you see the watchguard and say, Armageddon may break out. It says, Armageddon will break out. Awake, May 22nd, 1969, page 15. What future for the young? If you are a young person, you also need to face the fact that you will never grow old in this present system of things. Why not? Because all the evidence in fulfillment of Bible prophecy indicates that this corrupt system is due to end in a few years. Of the generation that observed the beginning of the last days in 1914, Jesus foretold, this generation will by no means pass away until all these things occur. Therefore, as a young person, you will never fulfill any career that this system offers. If you are in high school and thinking about a college education, this means at least four, perhaps even six or eight more years to graduate into a specialized career. But where will this system of things be by that time? It will be well on the way towards its finish, if not actually gone. This is why parents who base their lives on God's prophetic word find it much more practical to direct their young ones into trades that do not require such a long period of additional schooling. And trades such as carpentry, plumbing, and others will be useful not only now, but perhaps even more so in the reconstruction work that will take place in God's new order. With such practical trades, many young persons have been able to sustain themselves with part-time work. This allows them to spend much more of their time helping interested persons to learn God's requirements for life by studying the Bible with them. True, those who do not understand where we are in this in the stream of time from God's viewpoint will call this impractical. But which is really impractical? Preparing yourselves for a position in this world that soon will pass away? Or working towards surviving the systems and, and enjoying eternal life in God's righteous new order? The Kingdom Ministry of June 1969 on page 3. Will you be finishing school soon? If so, what have you decided to do after you graduate? Or are you one who has already finished school? What course of activity are you pursuing? Of course, there may be a tempting offer of higher education or of going into some field of work that promises material re rewards. However, Jehovah God holds out to you young folks many marvelous privileges of service in His organization. Which will you decide to take up? In view of the short time left, a decision to pursue a career in this system of things is not only unwise, but extremely dangerous. On the other hand, a decision to take advantage of what God offers through His organization opens up excellent opportunities for advancement as well as a rich, meaningful life that will never end. Turning down worldly opportunities in order to pioneer. Many young brothers and sisters were offered scholarships of, or employment that promised fine pay. However, they turned them down and put spiritual interests first. Now, the honest question to ask right now is, if they were not saying the world's going to end in 1975, then why is it that they were allowing their members to do this?
even going as far as telling the kids that they're not going to live long enough to grow old. I mean, come on, guys. This is what they were teaching their people leading up to 1975, and there's more. Take a listen to this. The Watchtower of May 1st, 1970, page 273. An in gathering affecting all mankind. Everyone would like to know how much longer the present system will continue and when God's purpose will be accomplished on earth in the same full way as in heaven. Jesus answered that this good news of the kingdom will be preached in all the inhabited earth. And then the end will come. Hence, in the Greek Bible text, he used the word telos, or end, to distinguish what he meant from the syntelia, or conclusion, of the system of things, the harvest period in which we now live. How close we may exactly be to the end of the present divisive system of things cannot be predicted, as Jesus reported that even he did not know the day or the hour at, at the time of his earthly ministry. However, Bible chronology, which indicates that Adam was created in the fall of the year 4026 BCE, would bring us down to the year 1975 CE, as the date marking 6,000 years of human history, with yet 1,000 years to come for Christ's kingdom. This corroborates the understanding of Jesus' words that the generation alive in 1914, with the outbreak of World War I, would not pass away until the end comes. Only a short time, then, remains for, the, for persons who love righteousness to show God that they want to be in the ark, his ark of protection, and live to see the blessings of the new system of things. The Kingdom Ministry of May 1974 on page 3. How are you using your life? Yes, the end of the system is so very near. Is that not reason to increase our activity? In this regard, we can learn something from a runner who puts on a final burst of speed near the finish of a race. Look at Jesus, who apparently stepped up his activity during his final days on earth. In fact, over 27% of the material in the Gospels is devoted to just the last week of Jesus' earthly ministry. By carefully and prayerfully examining our own circumstances, we also may find that we can spend more time and energy in preaching during this final period before the present systems end. Many of our brothers and sisters are doing just that. This is evident from the rapidly increasing number of pioneers. Yes, since the summer of 1973, there have been new peaks in pioneers every month. Now there are 20,394 regular and special pioneers in the United States, an all-time peak. That is 5,190 more than there were in February of 1973, a 34% increase. Does that not warm our hearts? Reports are heard of brothers selling their homes and property and planning to finish out the rest of their days in this old system in the pioneer service. Certainly, this is a fine way to spend the short time remaining before the wicked world's end. Now, I want you to take notice once again. They're talking about their members selling their homes and property and preparing to spend out the rest of their time, etc. Notice they didn't say, wait a second, brothers, we never tried to say the world was ending in 1975. That's not what we're saying. Why are you selling your homes? They didn't say that. They said, surely this will be a fine way to spend the rest of the time before the wicked world's end. Why? Because when they sold their homes and emptied their bank accounts and sold their possessions, where do you think they sent the money? Well, of course, they sent the money to the leadership of the Jehovah's Witnesses. They sent the money to the governing body, to the so-called faithful, discreet slave, because they believe that if they did this, they will be gaining favor with God. They do not understand that you don't have to buy God's favor by going through some organization. And it's sad to see that they did this to their members. But you're seeing now firsthand through speeches and through their writings that they did say the world was going to end in 1975. Here's more evidence. The 1971 book, The Nations Shall Know That I Am Jehovah, page 216. Jehovah soared against all those of flesh. Shortly, within our 20th century, the battle in the great day of Jehovah will begin against the modern antitype of Jerusalem, Christendom. In the next audio you're about to hear, it's taken from a 1968 assembly in Texas. I want you to hear how the speaker is talking about that they have less than 83 months left and how they tie 1975 to Armageddon. So Jehovah's word is in your mouth. This good news must be preached first before Armageddon. There is, will be now a remaining few months, not really a, a full 83 months remaining. So let's be faithful and confident and we'll be alive beyond the war of Babylon. 
we will be alive beyond the war of Armageddon. Yes, brothers and sisters, by doing this, having plenty to do, we will be alive in God's new system of things to live and to share in the work for a thousand years. And there will be plenty to do for the next 1,000 years. So after all these years of telling their members leading up to 1975 that 1975 was a marked date, 1975 was going to absolutely positively be Armageddon, taking it to the news media, the whole nine yards, getting their members so hyped and excited, 1975 was finally there. The date that they had set was September the 5th, 1975, but the predictions that they were making of the things that were supposed to happen leading up to Armageddon was not happening. This became very clear to the leader of the Watchtower back then, Fred Franz, as he began to uh, try to figure some way to weasel out of this long-running false prophecy that his organization was now involved in because of becoming very clear to him that the things that they predicted were supposed to be leading up to Armageddon, all these bad and terrible things that were supposed to happen leading up to Armageddon was not happening. But they were now on the record, on the radio, in the press, in the newspapers, in their books and magazines, and in their speeches, they were on the record saying September the 5th, September the 5th, September the 5th, 1975 was going to be Armageddon. So now, how is he going to try to back out of this? Realizing that they have now been caught in a lie. September the 5th was coming and the world was not going to end. This is a Jehovah's Witness leadership that claims to this day, they still claim that they are a direct channel to God. That God's only channel, they claim, is them. And you have to understand something, as I've told people time and time again. Nowhere in the Bible does it teach that the God of heaven uses channels. Satan and the demonic forces can be reached by channels. But you don't reach the God of heaven by channels. You reach him through prayer. So what's going on? How is Mr. Franz going to weasel his way out of this false prediction that they were caught in again? Clearly, the things they were prophesying that was supposed to happen was not happening. So once again, they go to the press and they try to change their story. Here is one of the articles here. You put it on the screen here. And here's what it says. The end is near. Maybe. Date uncertain. Jehovah's Witnesses told. The articles by John Dart. Times religion writer. It says in the bold print. Many made preparations for judgment believe due in the fall of 1975. And you can see the chart there at the bottom of this article where in 1974 there was an explosion. It says here an Armageddon boom of growth within the Jehovah's Witness group in 1974 because they were telling people the world's going to end in 1975. People began to join in large numbers. And now 1975 was here, and the world was not ending. And what was the Jehovah Witness leadership going to do, being that they have trumpeted this date for year after year after year after year? They're now trying to back down and say they're uncertain about the date. According to their book, Life Everlasting and Freedoms of the Sons of God, they said, according to our trustworthy Bible chronology. They said it was trustworthy. They also said it was Bible. But clearly it wasn't King James Bible. King James Bible told the truth. So what Bible are they using? Well, they're using the one they wrote. The one that they wrote to make it say what they wanted it to say. Folks, the article's clear. 
they're trying to back down from it. But you just seen leading all the way up to here that they were so absolute that 1975 was going to be the end. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to present you with a speech by Mr. Franz that he gives in front of a large group of Jehovah's Witnesses and you're going to hear this man try to weasel his way out and as usual with a false prophet when their dates are proven to be wrong they do not admit that they are wrong. They just simply try to push the date back a year, two years, three years down the road. You're going to hear him doing this when he starts talking about Adam and Eve. You're going to hear him trying to push the 1975 date down to 1976 and then the 1977 and starts pushing it forward. Now, I tell Jehovah's Witnesses this. Why do you let your leaders get away with lying to you like this? The King James Bible says, how shall we know that which the Lord has spoken when it comes to prophets? How do we know the thing which the Lord has spoken? The Bible says if the thing does not come to pass, that's the thing the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. The Bible goes on to say that that false prophet is to be put to death. Why? Because he lied on God. He's claiming to represent God when he doesn't, and he's misleading people and deceiving people in the process. And I let Jehovah's Witnesses know, if a Christian minister had done the exact same thing that your leaders did, you would condemn them as a false prophet and a false teacher. But when your own leaders do it, over and over and over again, 1914, 1925, 1975, the year 2020. Oh, did you forget that your leader came out and said in 2020, he said, we're in the last days of the last days of the last days. And he's claiming to speak on behalf of Jehovah. The spread of this disease is distressing, to be sure. But we're really not uh, surprised to see the world in the grip of such pestilence, are we? Jesus made it clear at Luke 21, 11, that pestilence would be part of the sign of the last days. And in Revelation chapter 6, the ride of the fourth horseman includes mention of deadly plague. So the events unfolding around us are making clearer than ever that we're living in the final part of the last days, undoubtedly the final part of the final part of the last days, shortly before the last day of the last days. Here we are two and a half years after the last days of the last days of the last days, and we still haven't had the last day. It's another false prophecy, Jehovah's Witness. Why did you overlook that? Why are you still part of that group? How long are you going to allow them to keep lying to you? And keeping you in perpetual, constant fear that the world is going to end and they keep making these false prophecies over and over and over and over and over. And you keep following along. I believe that it's very important to deal with this issue of the end times. It's so frustrating that so many have misread what the Bible clearly says because of the way that leaders like this Jehovah Witness leader has just taken a verse completely out of its context to make it fit what they wanted to say rather than putting it in its context then have people understand what's actually being said by the Lord. Now what we have here is the book of Matthew chapter 24 where the story is talked about. If you were to ask a Jehovah's Witness, are we in the end times? They'd say yes. You would ask them, why do you believe we're in the end times? They would say, oh, because of the wars and the rumors of wars and the famines and the pestilence and the, the diseases and the pandemics and all the evil that's in the world. They'll say, no, the Bible says these are the signs that we're at the end. But is that what the Bible says? Is that what the King James Bible actually says, folks? Let's take a look. Matthew chapter 24, starting at verse 4. Jesus said unto them, Jesus answered and said unto them, 
Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars, and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Did he say wars, rumors of wars, famines, and pestilence were a sign of the end? Or did he say all these things have to come to pass, but don't let it trouble you, the end is not yet? He said the end is not yet, meaning those are not the signs. Let's continue to read verse 7. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines, and pestilence, and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Did he say all these as proof that we're near the end? No. It's the beginning of sorrows. He's telling them when you see wars, rumors of wars, famines, pestilence, and all these things happening, he told them specifically, do not be troubled. The end is not yet. So literally, the leadership of the Jehovah's Witnesses have been running this religion under this idea that the world is going to end at any second, and they keep their people in fear based upon this idea that the world is going to end at any second based upon wars, rumors of wars, famines, pestilence, and all this. But Jesus didn't say that those things were the signs were at the end. He said the exact opposite. They asked him, what are the signs of thy coming and of the end of the world? And he told them what were not the signs, so that they wouldn't be afraid. And near the end, he tells them what the signs are. The sun will go dark, the moon will not give her light. That's when you know you're near the end. The same story is talked about in the book of Mark, chapter 13. Let's read what it says, chapter 13, verse 1. And as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples said unto him, Master, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here? And Jesus answering said unto him, Seest thou these great buildings? There shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives over against the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign when all these things shall be fulfilled? And Jesus answering them began to say, Take heed, lest any man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Be ye not troubled, for such things must needs be, but the end shall not be yet. That is the exact opposite of what the Jehovah's Witness leaders teach. They say these things are the signs. Jesus said these things are not the signs. Who are you going to believe? For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be earthquakes in diverse places, and there shall be famines and troubles. These are the beginning of sorrows. He didn't say that these were the end of the world or the signs that were at the end. When you go to the book of Luke, the verses that he decided to quote from, Starting at Luke chapter 21, verse 5, let's see what it actually says. Does it say that these are the signs that we're at the end of the world when you say wars and rumors of wars and famines and pestilence when you see these things? Is it saying that those are the signs that we're at the end? Well, Matthew says no, those are not the signs. Mark says no, these are not the signs. Let's take a look at Luke and see what Luke says. Luke chapter 21, verse 5. And as some spake of the temple... How it was adorned with goodly stones and gifts, he said, As for these things which ye behold, the days will come in which there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And they asked him, saying, Master, but when shall these things be? And what sign will there be when these things shall come to pass? And he said, Listen very closely. Listen very closely. Verse 8. And he said, Take heed that ye be not deceived, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and the time draweth near. Go ye not therefore 
after them. But when ye shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified, for these things must first come to pass, but the end is not by and by. The Jehovah Witness leader just told you that wars, rumors of wars, famines, pestilence, diseases, pandemics are all signs that we're at the end. But the Bible clearly teaches here that wars, rumors of wars, famines, pestilence, and all these things are not the signs at all. Jesus said, when you see these things happen, don't be troubled. Don't let it bother you. Don't be terrified. It's not the end yet. Don't let these things scare you. All these things have to happen. Why? Because we're in a sinful world that has rejected Jesus Christ. They use his name as a curse word. So the natural progression is going to be mankind is going to fall into wars and rumors of wars. In fact, they're going to fall into sin because they rejected Jesus. This is the natural progression. And he says, when you see these things, don't be afraid. Don't be terrified. The end's not yet. Don't let it scare you. But I want you to get this for those of you who either are studying with Jehovah's Witnesses or if you've been a Jehovah's Witness. You've probably never seen this verse. Never, you probably read over this verse and didn't even notice what you were reading. Let's go back to verse 8. Luke chapter 21, verse 8. Jesus said, Take heed that ye be not deceived. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ. What does the word Christ mean? It means the anointed one. They're going to claim to be the anointed brothers. They're going to claim to be the anointed ones, the special chosen ones of God. Listen to what Jesus said. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and the time draweth near. Isn't that what the Jehovah's Witness group does they claim that they're the special chosen anointed one of God and that the time draweth near. The end is near. Armageddon's right around the corner. Isn't that what they tell you day after day after day after day? Yet what did Jesus say? Next sentence. Go ye not therefore after them. Go ye not therefore after them. That word ye means all of you. All of you who are listening. Do not follow after anybody who says that they're the anointed ones of God and the end is near. You were warned not to become part of this Jehovah Witness group by Jesus himself right here because their whole message is the end is near, the end is near, the end is near, the end is near. And they've been saying the end is near since the late 1800s when their religion began. They set dates for the end of the world as you're seeing here. 1879. 1914, 1915, 1925. They said World War II was going to end with Armageddon. Didn't happen. They said 1975 was going to end with Armageddon. Didn't happen. They said 2020 was going to lead to Armageddon. It did not happen. We're still here. Why? Because the Lord Jesus Christ, who does not lie, said, these are just the beginning of sorrows. When you see these things, wars, rumors of wars, famines, pestilence, and all these things, don't be afraid. Don't be terrified. It's not the end. The end is not yet. And anyone who comes to you telling you that it is the end, Jesus said right here in Luke chapter 21, verse 8, go ye not after them. Don't follow them. They're lying to you. People had their lives wasted by the Jehovah's Witness group. Decades and decades, generation after generation after generation, waiting for the end, waiting for the end, waiting for the end, waiting for the end, and the end never comes. Why? Because they didn't listen to Jesus. They listened to a bunch of men in New York. They could have had free lives and be in contact with their family and friends and have a whole full life. Jesus said, I came that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Nobody inside that group can say they have abundant life. They are under the bondage of that group that you have to follow all those rules that are put upon them by that group. There's no freedom there. You're not free to speak your mind there. You'll get kicked out if you speak your mind. Jesus said, don't follow after anybody that comes to you claiming they are the Christ, that they are the anointed ones of God. And he says they're going to come teaching the time draw off near. If they come claiming that they are anointed ones of God and they claim that the time draw off near or the end is right around the corner or Armageddon is right around the corner, God said, do not follow after them. 
it is your choice. You can listen to the Lord Jesus who never lies. Or you can keep listening to these guys in New York who has a long track record, as you're seeing right now, of making up dates for the end of the world, getting people all scared and terrified that the world is going to end. As you saw that chart earlier, their numbers went up huge one year before their big end of the world, 1975. And then 1975 came. 1975 went. The world didn't end. And what happened to all those people who sold their homes, sold their property, emptied their bank accounts, and sent all the money to the leaders of the Jehovah's Witnesses, thinking that by doing so, it was going to get them brownie points with God. What happened when the world didn't end? And they're broke, with no house, no money, no nothing. What happened? They were left hanging high and dry by the Jehovah's Witness leadership. They didn't refund nobody anything. And the leader of the Jehovah's Witnesses at that time... Mr. Franz comes out in front of a group of Jehovah's Witnesses at an assembly and he tries to weasel his way out. He's trying to weasel his way out of the 1975 false prediction because he can clearly see that the thing that they predicted that was supposed to happen leading up to September 5th, 1975 was not happening. And you're going to hear his entire speech where he's trying to weasel his way out, trying to buy himself some time, trying to stretch it out another year, trying to stretch it out another two years. As all false prophets do when they get their prophecies wrong, they never admit they're wrong. They always keep pushing the date back, trying to buy themselves time. Take a listen to what the Jehovah's Witness leader at the time, Mr. Fred Franz, had to say when he realized that his prophecy was false, listen to him try to weasel his way out. Consequently, the sixth creative day came to an end with the creation of Eve. Now, how long after the creation of Adam that was, the Bible does not specify. We cannot definitely calculate. But it was a period of time shorter or longer. Now, if it was just a month after Adam's creation, then 6,000 years from Eve's creation would still end in this uh, secular calendar year of 1975. It would end in, in October. If it were two months after Adam's creation, then it would end uh, two months after September the 5th in November. If it were three months, then the time interval would end in December, early in December, well before December the 31st. But if it were longer than three months, or if it were a full year after Adam's creation, that he was created, then the 6,000 years of human existence, uh, uh, including Eve, would end in 1976. There were two years, say. Why, then it would end in 1977. So you see, we can expect that after September the 5th, sundown of 1975, there will be a period of time corresponding with the interval between Adam and Eve's creation. And this period of time will run on for how long we don't know, until 6,000 years from Eve's creation takes place, or terminates. In other words, 6,000 years from the end of the sixth creative day will terminate at the uh, end of this uh, indefinite interval of time. Well, since that is the case, then we do not necessarily have to insist or even expect that everything is going to be through and over with by September the 5th of this year. But rather, since there is an interval of time that must follow before 6,000 years of uh, uh, human creation from Eve coming on the scene, things could happen that interval of time that yet uh, remains to be made. 
measured off in our experience. Before the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ begins. Therefore, we see that September the 5th of this year does not mean that we are 6,000 years into the seventh creative day, the Sabbath day of Jehovah God, and that immediately after September the 5th, why the millennial kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ must begin in order to fulfill the final thousand years of God's great seventh creative day. according to the way that uh, affairs are going in the world and according to the admissions of the uh, ruling class of this world. Then there could come the great tribulation in which first Babylon the Great, the world empire of false religion, will be utterly wiped out and the earth be cleansed of all false religion, and this to be followed immediately by the annihilation of all the political powers and superpowers of this world in the battle of the great day of God, the Almighty of Armageddon. And then, instantly following that, the enchaining of Satan the devil and his demons, and the hurling of them into the abyss for a thousand years. And after that, by the thousand-year reign of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, would begin. So we see that God could accomplish uh, this in that interval of time, which should follow uh, September the 5th, 1975. And God can make a speedy work of it. He says he's going to make a short work of it, cut it short in righteousness. And did not the Lord Jesus Christ tell us that uh, this tribulation will be so devastating that if it were not cut short, no human flesh would survive. But on account of the chosen ones whom God has chosen, he has cut short the days, and therefore some flesh will survive. And that's where the great crowd of other sheep The battle of Armageddon as its finale and the binding of Satan and the surviving into the righteous new system of things established by God on earth under the heavenly kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So it can come quickly within a short time after the terminal day of the lunar year 1975. We should not uh, jump to wrong uh, decisions on that account and say, well, the time after September the 5th, 1975 is indefinitely long, and so it allow for me uh, to realize my uh, human aspirations, getting married and raising a family and kids, or uh, uh, going to college for a few years and learning engineering and finding a fine uh, position as an engineer, a civil engineer, or electrical engineer, or some other prominent uh, fine-paying job. No, the time does not allow for that, dear friends. The time is short, as the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter uh, 7 and verse 29, the time left is reduced. and it's 1900 years reduced by now the year 1975 and evidently there's not much time left so Jesus warned us that this thing is coming as a thief in the night it's going to snap shut like a trap upon the world of mankind the outbreak of this great tribulation and it's near some of you are hearing these recordings for the first time. 
and maybe you want to play them over a few times so that you can see that every time they tell you today they never tried to predict the end of the world for 1975, you know they're not telling you the truth because the evidence is right in front of you, right here. The writings that they wrote, the speeches that they gave, as clear as day. If they wasn't saying the world is going to end in 1975, then why did they tell their members, don't get married, don't have kids, don't go to college, because there's not enough time. And just when you thought that it couldn't get worse, when their prediction for 1975 failed to come to pass, what did the leadership of the Watchtower do? Well, I'm going to show you in their own publications. They did not accept responsibility themselves. They instead blamed the members of the group, that their members misunderstood them. Take a listen to this. The Watchtower of March 15, 1980, page 17 and 18. Choosing the best way of life. In modern times, such eagerness, commendable in itself, has led to attempts at setting dates for the desired liberation from the suffering and troubles that are the lot of persons throughout the earth. With the appearance of the book Life Everlasting and Freedom of the Sons of God, and its comments as to how appropriate it would be for the millennial reign of Christ to parallel the seventh millennium of man's existence, considerable expectation was aroused regarding the year 1975. There were statements made then and thereafter, stressing that this was only a possibility. Unfortunately, however, along with such cautionary information, there were other statements published that implied that such realization of hopes by that year was more a probability than a mere possibility. It is to be regretted that these latter uh, statements apparently overshadowed the cautionary ones and contributed to a build-up of the expectation already initiated. In its issue of July 15, 1976, the Watchtower commenting on the inadvisability of setting our sights on a certain date stated, if anyone has been disappointed through not following this line of thought, he should now concentrate on adjusting his viewpoint, seeing that it was not the word of God that failed or deceived him and brought disappointment, but that his own understanding was based on wrong premises. In saying anyone, the Watchtower included all disappointed ones of Jehovah's Witnesses, hence including persons having to do with the publication of the information that contributed to the build-up of hopes centered on that date. The 1988 Yearbook of Jehovah's Witnesses, pages 190 and 191. However, the first few months of the 1976 service year began with a marked decrease in publishers and own Bible studies. This downward trend was to continue for over three years, bottoming out in a 26% decrease in publishers from 32,693 in August 1975 to 24,285 in November 1978. Memorial attendance dropped too, from over 68,000 in 1975 to 49,545 in 1978. The brothers at the branch were perplexed. Would the trend be reversed? Of course, neither they nor the society were just letting it slide by. The Society's letter of April 4, 1977 stated, We hope the brothers are careful in their teachings. Evidently, some were very strong on the 1975 date, and so a good foundation was not laid. The foundation, of course, should be faith in Christ Jesus and the ransom sacrifice, and the dedication should be with understanding. A very candid observation indeed. Too much emphasis was placed on a date by some Bible teachers, Many newly baptized ones took up the truth on a wave of emotion. Even some elders had their hopes pinned to 1975. In addition, materialism seeped into the land as a result of the rapid economic growth in Korea, and nationalism was on the rise, the effect apathy among the brothers. Adult Christians, too, can be disappointed, and this has in some cases led to spiritual disaster. Some set their hope on a date when they were sure Armageddon would come. When nothing happened on that day, they felt let down. The 1995 Yearbook of Jehovah's Witnesses on page 227. There came a time of sifting, that is the removal of the evil ones. There were strong expectations concerning the year 1975 and what it might mean in the fulfillment of Jehovah's purpose. Some set their hearts on that date as the time when the old system would be destroyed and God's new world would be established. When those expectations were not realized, there were some who ceased serving God. A number became apostates, but the vast majority of Jehovah's Witnesses were motivated by love for Jehovah. They knew that God's word would never fail. Awake June 22, 1995, on page 9. Bible students known since 1931 as Jehovah's Witnesses also expected that the year 1925 would see the fulfillment of marvelous Bible prophecies. 
They surmised that at that time, the earthly resurrection would begin bringing back faithful men of old such as Abraham, David, and Daniel. More recently, many witnesses conjectured that events associated with the beginning of Christ's millennial reign might start to take place in 1975. Their anticipation was based on the understanding that the seventh millennium of human history would begin then. These erroneous views did not mean that God's promises were wrong, that he had made a mistake. By no means, the mistakes or misconceptions, as in the case of first century Christians, were due to a failure to heed Jesus' caution. You do not know the time. The wrong conclusions were due not to malice or unfaithfulness to Christ, but to a fervent desire to realize the fulfillment of God's promises in their own time. I'm sure some of you for the first time are getting an opportunity to see what the Watchtower leadership did leading up to 1975. A lot of people's lives were destroyed because of the Watchtower Society. They sold their homes, property, didn't have children during that 10-year period, and they passed the point in their life where they could have children by the time 1976, 1977 rolled in, and they found out that the whole thing was a false prophecy. Their lives were destroyed. And as you saw, the Watchtower Society accepts no responsibility to this day for what they did. But this is not the only time they've done something like this. In your 2013 Bible version, they have back here a, a little uh, picture stating that in 1914, Jesus cast a dragon out of heaven. I found that very interesting when I saw it. It says, about 1914 CE, Jesus hurled the serpent, Satan, to the earth, confining him there for a short time. Revelation 12, 7 through 9 and 12. I found that very interesting because they made a statement concerning 1914 and put no proof. I could say anything happened in 1914. And as you see, or as you're about to see, I'm going to show you what really happened in 1914 from their own writings. First of all, was the original prediction that they made concerning 1914 that Jesus was going to cast a dragon down here? Let's take a look and see what their original prophecy was for the events of 1914. In order to do so, we have to go to the writings that they did before 1914. So we're going to start with this book here called The Time is at Hand. The Time is at Hand. We'll open it up. I'll show you. It's a Watchtower Bible and Tract Society publication. We'll put it up on the screen. 1889 Watchtower Bible and Tract Society publication. I'll put it on the screen for you so you'll all see it. On page 76, they make a statement concerning 1914. Now remember, this is written back in the late 1800s, so 1914 hasn't gotten here yet. 1889 edition it has here. It says, page 76, bottom paragraph. In this chapter, we present the Bible evidence proving that the full end of the Gentile times, i.e., the full end of their lease of dominion, will be reached in A.D. 1914. And that date will be the furthest limit of the rule of imperfect men. And be it observed that if this is shown to be a fact firmly established in the Scripture, it will prove, firstly, that the date of the kingdom of God from which our Lord taught us to pray, saying, Thy kingdom come, will obtain full universal control, and that it will then be set up or firmly established in the earth on the ruins of present institutions. Now, when he says present, he's not talking about our present day. He's talking about his present day, 1914. So we're going to go down this list of things that he said would have to happen, and we're going to ask, did these things happen? So the first thing, Firstly, that at that date, the kingdom of God, from which our Lord taught us to pray, saying, Thy kingdom come, will obtain full universal control, and that it will then be set up or firmly established in the earth on the ruins of present institutions. Did that happen in 1914? Secondly, it will prove that he whose right it is to thus take the dominion 
will then be pre present as Earth's new ruler, and not only so, but it will also prove that he will be present for a considerable period before that date, because the overthrow of the Gentile government is directly caused by his dashing them to pieces as a potter's vessel, Psalms 2.9, Revelation 2.27, and establishing in their stead his own righteous government. Did that happen in 1914? All the governments destroyed, dashed into pieces like a potter's vessel? Thirdly, it will prove that sometime before the end of A.D. 1914, the last member of the divinely recognized Church of Christ, the royal priesthood, the body of Christ will be glorified with the head because every member is to reign with Christ, being a joint heir with him of the kingdom, and it cannot be fully set up without every member. Did that happen in 1914? This is what they're prophesying is going to happen. Fourthly, it will prove that from that time forward, Jerusalem shall no longer be trodden down of the Gentiles, but shall rise from the dust of divine disfavor to honor, because the time of the Gentiles will be fulfilled or completed. Did that happen in 1914? Fifthly, it will prove that by that date or sooner, Israel's blindness will begin to be turned away because their blindness in part was to continue only until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in, Romans 11.25, or, in other words, until the full number from among the Gentiles who are to be members of the body or bride of Christ should be fully selected. Sixthly, it will prove that the great time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, will reach its culmination in a worldwide reign of anarchy, and then men will learn to be still and know that Jehovah is God and that he will be exalted in the earth. The condition of things spoken of in symbolic language as raging waves of the sea, melting earth, falling mountains, and burning heavens will then pass away, and the new heavens and new earth with their peaceful blessings, will begin to be recognized by trouble-tossed humanity. But the Lord's anointed and his rightful and righteous authority will first be recognized by a company of God's children while passing through the Great Tribulation. The class represented by M and T on the chart of the ages, see also pages 235 to 239, volume 1. Afterward, just as its close by fleshly Israel, and ultimately by mankind in general. Seventhly, it will prove that before that date, God's kingdom, organized in power, will be in the earth, and then smite and crush the Gentile image, Daniel 2.34, and fully consume the power of these kings. Its own power and dominion will be established as fast as by a varied influences and agencies. It crushes and scatters the powers that be, civil and ecclesiastical, iron and clay. Seven predictions that they made concerning the events of 1914. Did any of these things happen? I want to stress the fact also, today the leadership of the Watchtower Society talks about 1914, 1914, 1914. What they fail to bring to your attention fully if they didn't just say 1914 in general. They, just like 1975, had a specific date that was set. Their dates are always set to the lunar calendar. Their date was October 1914. That's when everything was supposed to go down. October 1914. This here is a screenshot from your JW site where it says, again, October 1914, was the time of the Jesus reign and all these things were supposed to happen. The reason why they just say 1914 in general now is because their prophecies, as you saw the list, and that's just one of the lists, their prophecy failed. What they said was going to happen didn't happen. 
So they say now the entire year of 1914. That way they can encompass World War I and claim that they predicted World War I. In that list you just heard there, there was no World War I. They were talking Armageddon, end of the world, Jesus setting up his kingdom on the ruins of present-day institutions, the end of ecclesiastical domination, the end of political reign, complete Armageddon, and Jesus setting up his full kingdom and full kingdom power by 1914. That is not what happened. But you don't have to take my word for it. The Watchtower, in three sources, tells you that the events of 1914 that they prophesied to happen never happened. The problem is, they keep these sources hidden from you. Here's one. This book is called Light, Book One. It's put together by Joseph Franklin Rutherford, second president of the Watchtower Society. Light, Book One. I'll put it up on the screen for you. Light, Book One, by Joseph Franklin Rutherford, 1930. 16 years after 1914. Joseph Franklin Rutherford was a member of the Watchtower Society during that time in 1914. He stood alongside Charles Taze Russell waiting for the end of the world in Armageddon. And when it didn't happen, he took some time to write down what happened. In this book, Light, Book One, page 194, the topic is called Sackcloth. Now, we who are King James Bible people, we know what sackcloth is. It's talked about throughout the King James Bible. Sackcloth is what the ancients would wear when they were in great despair, mourning, and depression. Page 194, this is what he had to say, starting with the uh, middle paragraph. All the Lord's people looked forward to 1914 with joyful expectation. When that time came and passed, there was much disappointment, chagrin, and mourning. The Lord's people were greatly in reproach. They were ridiculed by the clergy and by their allies in particular and pointed to with scorn because they had said so much about 1914 and what would come to pass and their prophecies had not been fulfilled. One wearing sackcloth usually puts it on himself. God's people on earth after the reproach that came upon them following 1914 put sackcloth upon themselves as evidence of mourning. Why were they mourning after 1914? He said so, right here. The Lord's people were greatly in reproach. They were ridiculed by the clergy and their allies in particular and pointed to with scorn because they had said so much about 1914 and what would come to pass and their prophecies had not been fulfilled. 1914, as the Watchtower teaches it today, Dragons being cast down, invisible presence of Jesus coming to the earth, whole nine yards, the Watchtower being chosen, 1919 as God's organization, never happened. They put it in writing, and then they hid the book from you. But it's not hid anymore. 1930, they told you that 1914 was a false prophecy. In the yearbook of Jehovah's Witnesses, 1975, page 72, top paragraph, speaking of 1914, the Bible students certainly found this to be true in their case. Some of their experiences during the year of 1914 through 1916, for instance, brought disappointment and sorrow. Yet Jehovah upheld his people, never forsaking them. It brought disappointment and sorrow. Why? Nothing happened in 1914. I found it interesting in the middle paragraph here, that's what we're quoting somebody from back then. It says, That was a highly interesting time because a few of us seriously thought we were going to heaven during the first week of that October. Why would they think that? Because the Watchtower Society told them, just like 1975, they led them to believe the world was going to end in 1914. And when the Jehovah's Witness leaders prophesied that Armageddon would take place on September the 5th, 1975 failed, they blamed the members of the group, they kept the money and the property that was given to them by the members, and they denied that they ever made the prophecy, and they continued to cover this up 
They cover up this part of their history to this day. The average Jehovah Witness member has no idea this event ever took place because they're never told about it by their leaders and their leaders continue to deceive their members, leading them to think that they had nothing to do with what happened in the events of 1975. If you're hearing this for the first time, and you might be a Jehovah's Witness who happened to see this video come up in your list and you decided to click it, I want to thank you for taking the time to watch this video. But there are some things I really want you to think about. What if a professing Christian minister had done the exact same thing? Set a date for the end of the world. And then the world didn't end on that day. But a lot of hype was created during the build up to that day. And then that day comes and that day goes and the world doesn't end. What would you say about that man? Would you say he was a good man? Would you say, oh, don't worry about it. The light's going to get brighter and brighter for that man. No, you wouldn't. You'd say that man was a false prophet and they shouldn't be following that man. So why is it then that when the Watchtower organization does the exact same thing, you make excuses for them? Let me give you an example. There actually was a professing Christian man by the name of Harold Camping. Around 2011, this man had a large following of people too. And they had billboards and things put up all over the world telling people that the rapture was going to take place in the year 2011. And they had a specific date set out. They did the same thing that Jehovah's Witnesses did. They even went to the press talking about it. They had billboards put up all over the place. They had their members standing outside with placard signs with the dates on it. They had trucks that had been wrapped with these uh, slogans about the end of the world taking place on that specific date in 2011. And the Jehovah's Witnesses' own website condemned Harold Camping as a false teacher and a false prophet. Isn't it ironic? His members did the exact same thing the Jehovah's Witness members did. He did the exact same thing that the Jehovah's Witness leaders did. And they condemn him as a false prophet without realizing that they're guilty of the same false prophecy. This is even one of the newscasts on the day that this man said the world was supposed to come to an end. I want you to hear this interview with this religious spokesman. And I want you to hear the parallels between what Harold Camping did and what the Jehovah's Witness leaders have done based upon what you've already just seen. Take a look at this work out uh, uh, when the world began and when it's going to end from all the numbers there and he's been doing this. One of his colleagues says he goes through the numbers in the Bible rather like doing a Sudoku puzzle and worked it out from that. Do you think he's right? Uh, no, I don't think he's right at all. Uh, I think the chances of uh, anyone being able to predict the end day are so remote that it's far more realistic to think about one's uh, own end perhaps. It, it's, it is a bit worrying, though, because those who go along with his theory, some of them even have sold their houses, they've moved away, they're preparing for this, and he said it before, it didn't happen then, it might not happen now, so therefore he does have influence. Yes, he does. I, I've spoken to one um, chap who uh, handed the, his house keys over to his sister and said, I'm not coming back, and he gave up a very lucrative job in New York in order to be able to uh, go around the world with this theory as an ambassador. We've had an e or a text in from Roger and he says it's not for mankind to know the time for this event as with the second coming of Christ. And he's quoting from Matthew. He says, watch therefore you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Well, that is the standard quote that Orthodox Christians uh, will, of course, come up with. Um, uh, it's got to be remembered, of course, that Harold Camping is a very idiosyncratic and fundamentalist uh, preacher. He's not mainstream in any way at all. <laughs> um, I think uh, 
there is perhaps in all this some sort of symptom of an anxiety perhaps people uh, know that life is fragile and they know that we're not immortal and these moments come along and remind us of them now, now you look at apocalypse theories mm -hmm. plural so they're obviously more than just this one well over the last 2,000 years or so um, I think there have been about 200 where specific days have actually been mentioned some of them have had a few followers some of them mm -hmm. have had a lot of followers uh, the granddaddy of them was actually in 1844. Um, William Miller said that the world was going to end and his movement ended with what was known as the Great Disappointment. When you see events, uh, the natural events we've had this year alone, mm. for instance, does it lend perhaps some credence to some of these theories? Yes, because there are other Bible passages that say when the end is nigh, certain things are going to happen and uh, earthquakes are one of those uh, indicators. But then there have always been earthquakes. Um, exactly when the key earthquakes are going to happen is anybody's guess. And uh, as you say, St Matthew, that, those words from St Matthew say that no one knows, only God knows. Ted Harrison, thank you. I hope when you watch that, you were able to see the parallels between what Harold Camping did and his false prophecy and what the Jehovah's Witness organization did with their false prophecy as well. When Harold Camping did it, the leadership of the Jehovah's Witnesses condemned him as a false prophet. When the leadership of the Jehovah's Witnesses did the exact same thing, setting a date September the 5th, 1975, and that date came and went and the world didn't end, the followers gave their leaders a pass, claiming the light will get brighter and brighter and all this stuff, rather than condemning them as false prophets as the Bible tells them to do. So I've already presented you now with two sources from the Jehovah's Witnesses' own literature pointing out that the events of 1914 that they claim happened never happened. I'm going to give you a third source, and this one here is a speech that was given by a Jehovah's Witness leader. And in this speech, I want you to listen very carefully because the audio is really bad. But I want you to listen very carefully to him say that the events of 1914 and the events of 1925 was a mistake. You're going to hear him clearly say that he does not want to repeat the mistakes of 1914 and 1925. I want you to listen very closely to what he says. Take a listen. to you to find out that 1914 was a story completely made up by the leadership of the Watchtower and they've been carrying this story for a hundred years now. 
You might ask, why would they continue to lie to you when they know what they're telling you is not true? Why would they continue to do it? It's real simple. The Watchtower Bible and Tract Society Incorporated is a big business, like Walmart, like McDonald's, like Coca-Cola. They're a big global business. Jehovah's Witnesses out going door to door are unpaid promoters of Watchtower material. Unpaid, but you go out and you do it. They operate under the guides of religion. Why? Because by presenting themselves as a religion, this big multi-million dollar company now becomes tax exempt. So here's what I want you to do. I, I understand. When you joined Watchtower, you joined because you believed that this was your way of reaching God. It's not your way of reaching God. You'll never reach God in the Watchtower. He had nothing to do with that organization from its beginnings. It is not his organization. Never has been. They call themselves God's channel. Show me in the scripture where God uses channels. I'll show you in the scripture where Satan uses channels. Channels is witchcraft. Think about it. Channels is witchcraft. I'm going to give you the hope that I have. I don't live in fear the world's going to end any minute. I know it's going to end when it ends. And Jesus is going to come back when he said he's going to come back. On the last day. Search the scriptures. You'll find he says it's going to come back on the last day. We don't know when the last day is. But we know there's a series of things that leads up to the last day. And we haven't gotten there yet. So the world's not going to end today. It's not going to end tomorrow. It's not going to end next week. Because there's way too many things to happen. This is what I stand on. If I die today, this is where I stand. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. John explains why he wrote the book of John. He said, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. If you as a Jehovah's Witness dies today, no matter how long you've been in the group, you honestly know that you have no clue if you're going to make it. You don't know if you've done enough. You don't know if you've worked enough. You don't know if you'll be found faithful enough. And that's one of the big differences between the God of the Watchtower and the God of my King James Bible. Jesus said, my, my load is easy. My burden is light. My burden is light. The Watchtower's burden is not light. Their burden is heavy, meeting after meeting after meeting, study after study after study of their books and magazines. Then you've got to go door to door and do all that, and then you've got to hope that you're, you're being good enough. As I said in the last video, God is a father. You don't have to earn your father's favor. If you try to earn the God of heaven's favor, you're going to lose him. Because what he's offering you is free. You can't earn it. Jesus, when he died, he paid the full price. You don't have to earn what Jesus purchased for you. He's standing there offering it to you. Will you take it? Or will you tell him, no, you choose the watchtower? That's your choice. I'm offering you what Jesus offered me through the scriptures. You want to be in favor with God? It says, believe on the name of the Son of God. You want the truth? Let me give you the truth. The truth is right here in this King James Bible. This is the Bible all the other Bibles attack. Why? Because it's the truth. It will tell you the truth. It will guide you to the truth. It will lead you to the truth. And if you follow it, You'll be obeying what God tells you. It's not too hard to read. Never has been too hard to read. There are tens of thousands of churches all over the world that still use this book. Don't tell me it's too hard to read. It's not hard to understand. We live in an information society, internet, books, and all kinds of stuff where you can find out what the definition of words are. This book is not too hard to understand. If you just pick it up and read it. And all I ask of you is this. They've taught you so much that was wrong. Here's the cleanser. Here's the cleanser to clean it out. Grab yourself a King James Bible. Open up to the book of Romans. Start reading. 
everywhere in this Bible that disagrees with what they taught you, let God be true. And let every man be a liar. Let God be true. And every man be a liar. Thank you all for tuning in to the video today. Hopefully you guys have uh, learned something new throughout this video process. For those who've asked about wanting to contribute to this ministry, I don't ask for money from people. I feel really weird asking people for money. I'd much rather you get something back for your money. So I have a music site, jasonzelda.com. On there is a group of songs that I've written, composed, put together, produced. I do all the work myself. And I hope you guys will enjoy it. And the way that the site is set up is that you can pay any price that you want for the song. So if you want to pay a dollar for a song, you can pay a dollar for a song. If you want to pay $500 for a song, you can pay $500. You can put whatever you want to pay for the songs. And if you want to contribute but you're not able to, don't worry about it. The site is also set up where you can listen to all my songs in their entirety without having to pay anything. So you can listen to them up to three times at least without having to pay anything at all, listening to the songs all the way through. So I hope you guys have enjoyed this ministry, and I'm going to continue on with more of the Hidden from Jehovah's Witness series being updated. Before I go, I wanted to bless you guys with one of the songs that I wrote. This one is called Mary's Mystic Banjo. And I look forward to seeing you guys on the next video. I'll see you guys down the road. Awaken the neon lights Mary's banjo ignites From the streets Mary plays her dear little banjo And the sound is open to speak When she sings Play that mystic banjo Hypnotize the world in your soul, be merry. Play that mystic banjo and let the night again win your soul, be merry. Awaken the neon tale, the mystical banjo. I'm